Uh, my name is Jason, and I am so thankful that you are here today. I'm excited about today because I actually have four people in the house that I went to high school with in Sacramento, California, and they're all here in the same room. I know. And they're sitting here right now seeing Jason from high school preach on stage, which is proof God can use anybody. I'm, I'm excited. I have a couple of announcements, and then we're going to jump into today's message. The first announcement is I just want to reiterate our men's retreat. For those of you that come in about five to six minutes late, you've been missing all of the announcements. And that's okay. Most of you are Baptists. That's just what you do. Uh, it, you can... Look at the front row right here. Tell me you're a Baptist church without telling me you're a Baptist church. I see you people in the back row. Nice, nice and full back there. Yep, Sherry. But I want to tell you about this men's retreat. It is coming up next month. And I know that if you are a family, a young family, that it may be a sacrifice for you ladies to be a single parent for a couple of days while, while your husband goes to the men's retreat but I assure you there will be no better investment in your family than to make the sacrifice for him to go there. The, uh, the cost of everything is skyrocketing. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but not our men's retreat. We cut the price in half. Literally, listen to this. Three days, catered meals and a T-shirt, and it's 25 bucks. I'm not making that up. It's $25, so money should not be, yep. The reason we're able to, to cover that cost and supplement it as a church is because of your guys' faithfulness. So the church is picking up that tab so that, nope, I don't want anybody to not go because of money. And so we've got a cornhole tournament, can jam. They're going to be throwing axes. They'll be shooting guns. We'll be having catered meals. Uh, I'm even going to go there and sleep in a tent in the woods, which I'm not pleased about but I'm willing to make that sacrifice. So men, if you want to sign up, you're running out of time. We got to know ahead of time. You can sign up at Welcome Central or starting tomorrow morning, you can go on our website. And if you go to give, which you should be anyways, there's a drop down menu that'll say men's retreat. And it's literally only 25 bucks. And if that's a problem, we also have people who have donated money saying we will sponsor if anybody needs to. And that's how, how giving you guys are. So I appreciate that so much. The other thing is, is start Starting this Wednesday is midweek. Now, we've been preparing for this, for this for a while. What it is going to be for midweek is an opportunity for us to really just dive into Scripture. So there's not going to be lights and worship and sound and all that's great. But this is going to be like an old-fashioned Bible study. And so I'm going to be, we're going to be leading this. We're going to be diving into Scripture starting this Wednesday. Bring your Bible, bring a journal, and we're just going to dive into the Word Wednesdays from 6 to 7.30 starting this Wednesday. And so we have Tiny Town that's going to be open. We we have CP kids and we have CP students all going on. So I hope that you will be there uh, starting this Wednesday. Let me pray and we'll jump into the message. Lord, I'm not satisfied, God, with you just being here. I recognize that you're in this room. I feel your presence, but, but that's not good enough for me. What I want, God, is I want you to be the catalyst, the cornerstone, the driving force. I want you to just anoint my mouth and um, I want people just in this room to have an interaction with you, God, because indeed one interaction with the Holy Spirit can change everything. And that's what we ask for today and all God's people said. Amen. We're starting this new collection called If I Only Had A dot, dot, dot. And what I want you to do with me during these next couple of weeks is really to let's go on a journey down the yellow brick road and look at all the different various characters and how we can apply deep theological truths to it. So as you saw on that video, today is If I Only Had A Heart. And I don't know if you remember who in the movie needed the heart. If you do, like, yell it out. And I actually have a tin man for you in the house today. Give it up for our tin man. That's impressive. I thought you were going to box jump that. So here is our Tin Man. Now here's the cool part, is each week we're going to have different characters in-house. And we're actually still taking applications for the Cowardly Lion, but I've had a few people give me names already. Charles Abbott, would you please stand up? If you want Charles to play the Cowardly Lion, make some noise. If you will love Jesus more if Charles plays the Cowardly Lion, raise your hand. Charles. 
Charles. But for now, we have the Tin Man, and here's what I'm excited about is our message has to do with the heart, and then after, Sonia, our Tin Woman, is going to be in Kid City, and we already have a photo banner set up with a yellow brick road in there to take pictures with your kids. Just tag us at Centerpoint TN on all social media platforms uh, and take pictures with the Tin Man. So the Tin Man needed a heart. Now, before you leave, I just want to share, this is the portion of scripture today that we are going to dissect, that we are going to hover over, and it takes place in Ezekiel. So Ezekiel 36, 26, listen to this verse. This is our theme for the day today. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's what we're going to talk about today. So I want you to remember the tin man. Make sure you take a picture with the tin wool man. I got to change my vernacular. Uh, And give her a hand, Sonia. She will see you after service. So I want you to understand that portion of scripture from Ezekiel. And it's huge because here's why. We all need to guard our heart. Proverbs, I think it's 423. I have the entire Bible memorized. Just checking. Proverbs 423, King Solomon, who's the wisest man, though he had 300 wives. I don't know exactly how wise he was. 700 wives, 300 concubines. He said this, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flows everything. And so what we have to do is we have to constantly be guarding our heart. Can I, can I share with you just a story for a minute? Is this a safe place? That wasn't, you didn't really convince me a whole lot. Is this a safe place? Yes, please don't tell anybody, and the internet is is always a safe place. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, I was driving through a town. I'm not going to say what town. It wasn't this town. And as I was driving through, there was a gentleman that was holding a sign asking for money on the side of the road. And I got my kids in the back seat, and I'm driving. And I know you don't do this, but here's what I did. Just forgive me. I know you don't do this. But when I see a man standing right here, and, and, and my car pulls up, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to stop directly next to where he is, and this is going to be awkward. So you don't do this. <laughs> but I do sometimes, and I did this one time. I, I lock the door, make sure the window's up, and just stare straight ahead. <laughs> like the most awkward, like don't even have your peripherals, like just stare. And, and as I'm doing, I know you don't do this, but, but as I'm doing this, I hear my daughters in the back seat and they are scrambling through their backpacks or purses or whatever they have because they say, do we have any money that we can help this guy? That's convicting y'all. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Not you, not you, but other church people. This is what they're thinking. Well, I don't know. If you give him money, he's just going to. Or what did he do to get himself there? He should go. There's plenty of places wanting to hire. And, and, and I understand all of that, and that doesn't make you a bad person if you think that. It actually makes you a very normal, average person. I thought that, and I get paid to be good. You guys are good for nothing. Come on. If, that, if you didn't like that, you got 27 more minutes. No, somebody just left. <laughs> right on cue. I'm out of here. I actually did see people leave in the parking lot. They walked in the door. They turned around, and they went right back into their car and left. And they said, oh, I'm sorry. This is the wrong church. We're meeting someone right down the street. I was like, wow, I've had people leave before, but not, not that early. Congratulations. And you just ran into the preacher in the parking lot. But anyway, I digress. So my kids are talking back there, and and that's when it starts, I start realizing without even knowing it that my heart has become hardened towards just humans that were knit together in their mother's womb by a creator. And and it was just kind of a moment where I was like, okay, okay, I need to to really pay attention to the posture of my heart because I've got to to guard my, my heart. And so what was Ezekiel talking about? when he is telling the Israelites that I will replace a heart of stone with a heart of flesh. So remember, if you want to understand Scripture, there's three things you got to remember. Context, context, context. All right? 
Those are the only three things you got to remember because people have left churches over terrible contexts. They've started cults over terrible contexts. And I think that even bad contexts is when some people are going to stand in front of the Lord and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you because they didn't look at Scripture in the proper context. So let's start off with the who, when, and why. Who, when, why. So who? Who is Ezekiel? Ezekiel is a prophet. And at the time, prophets, God spoke to prophets, and then prophets would deliver that message to the people. And it was around 600 years before Jesus. And so Ezekiel is actually going to to school to become a priest. And he's pretty close to his 30th birthday when he can become a priest. And then wouldn't you know it, the Babylonians take over the Israelites. It's like, I know that you face that. You're like, ah, right when I'm about to do something, Nebuchadnezzar comes in and ruins your life. Right, Brooklyn? No, never. But, But right when you're planning something and you have plans and God says, oh, no, my plans aren't your plans. Let's... Let's move you over here. And so he's about to become a priest, and Babylonian captivity takes over. So a guy by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, if you ever watch Veggie Tales, he's a giant cucumber. Some of you are like, oh, yeah, that guy. Nebuchadnezzar takes over. We're going to talk about him more next week when we say if I only had a brain. But he, he takes over, and here's what Nebuchadnezzar did to the Babylonian Empire. It was actually quite brilliant. Uh, he would take the choice specimen and he would bring them into captivity. So he had three different waves of bringing captives from Israel to Babylon. And the first wave, the guy by the name of Daniel, you may have heard of him. Later in life, he's going to be known as Daniel in the lion's den. He goes in the first wave. And later on, you hear about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and you hear about all of those things. So he takes him approximately 605 B.C., Then on the next wave, about nine years later, that's when Ezekiel gets taken captive. So Ezekiel is given a message by God to the Israelites who are right now in the middle of Babylonian captivity. And oh, by the way, just about a decade later is when the temple's going to get destroyed for the first time. So imagine for a moment if you are speaking to people from God and you're trying to tell them, hey, I got a message from God while you are without your home, while you are being held captive, and why it feels like Yahweh, who's been with you the whole time, now doesn't care, but I want you to listen to what I have to say. Consequently, it was rejected for the most part. And let me tell you what happened to the Israelites during this time and how we can apply this to our life. Because during Ezekiel's time, that was the why, by the way. During Ezekiel's time, he had two other pretty major contemporaries. We talked about Daniel, and then there's another one, if you know, the prophet Jeremiah, also known as the weeping prophet. Now, he's hanging out in Egypt at this time, but they all knew who he was. And so you had some pretty big contemporaries, and then here's Ezekiel who had a complete different plan to be a priest, and then God just puts him right over here in this particular time. And I'm sure Ezekiel is kind of like, why? I was doing what you wanted me to do. Why would I go into captivity and and now have to do this? And, And again, God doesn't care about your plans nearly as much as you care about your plans. He cares about his plans and his will, and he wants to use you for something even bigger than you could ever imagine. And that's what Ezekiel's facing. But here's why I think you and I can actually learn something from something that happened, you know, 22,600 years ago, roughly, is this. Is the Israelites allowed their hearts to become hardened because of two things. One is unmet expectations, and two is outside circumstances, things that they they just, and we're going to go through this a little more in depth, but here's what we got to be careful of, church, is that a lot of times if God doesn't answer a prayer the way you think he should, when you think he should, we stop praying, or we think God has forgotten about us. He's not listening. And you've been praying for three weeks. Three weeks. Oh, God doesn't care. He doesn't, he didn't give me that. And so there's ways that we can be careful of and be aware of our heart being hardened. I've had people that are just miserable for the rest of their life because their eye is bad. They see everything through the lens of being a victim. They see everything through a lens of what someone else did to them. And it hardens their heart towards God. And it can harden their heart towards church, really. 
If you've been in this church very long, at some point in time, there'll be an offense done against you. You want to know why? Because everybody here is really screwed up just like you. And you can allow, you're like, oh, you clap for that. Yes. <laughs> Me being the chief of sinners of the screw-ups, right? No, don't clap for that. What is wrong with you people? But here's the reality is, is that in any church, it doesn't matter. If you find the perfect church, don't go there because you'll mess it up when you get there. If you're at a church long enough, an offense will be done to you. And if you don't guard your heart, you'll start to grow resentment towards that church or towards those people or towards that leadership. And then you'll leave. And guess what? You'll go to the next one. And then you'll go to the next one. And then you'll go to the next one. If you're miserable at whatever job you're in right now, you'll be miserable at the next one because you're bringing your misery with you. You got to guard your heart. Have you ever had somebody who's just angry at God? I'm not intimidated by talking to atheists about about God because nine times out of 10, it has nothing to do with God. It has to do with religious people. And so it doesn't bother me. An atheist, that's an easy convert. The hard converts are the people that grew up in church that know more about the Bible than I do, and they just don't care because their heart has become a heart of stone. Those are the ones that God can't use. You are a spiritual rocking chair. You have something to do, but it's not getting anybody anywhere. Then we've got to constantly recalibrate our will with God's will. So there's two different ways that the Israelites and you and I can experience a hardening of our heart. And here they are. Petrification. No, I messed that up. Yeah, bad. No, I said that right. Petrification and calcification. And don't worry, we're going to go through all of this. On calcification, I'm going to need you medical experts to help me because all I have is a first aid marriage badge with the Boy Scouts of America. That's the extent of my medical profession. But let's talk about petrification first. This is outside circumstances. This is how something becomes petrified. When something dies, the decaying process starts. God has made this really cool way of taking care of things when they decay. And, and when they die, they just start decaying. So how does something become petrified? So your, your oxygen helps that decaying process massively. But when something dies in an, uh, that is not oxygen rich, then the decay process slows down dramatically. And then water will come in and bring minerals with it. And the minerals will actually go in, and what they do is they slow down the decaying process so rapidly. I actually wrote this down. The groundwater rich in minerals will impregnate the pores and the cellular spaces, and then they start to crystallize. Now, you may have 1% to 15% of the organic matter still in there, but the rest of it has become hard. Because of outside circumstances, the outside environment, lack of oxygen, rich minerals in the water, now all of a sudden from the outside, it has become hardened. So what was going on with the Israelites at this time is because Yahweh had, in their opinion, in their mind, forsaken them, they now take it out on God. And they missed it. The reason the Babylonians came in to take over was because that their hearts were shifting from God and God was trying to give them a wake-up call to pull them back to repentance. And they missed it. Instead of saying, how can we grow? They said, we're going to groan. And they allowed the outside influences of the Babylonian pagan culture to influence them. And, and, and so they started celebrating pagan holidays. And they started looking around and saying, our circumstances are not what we asked for, so we're going to blame God. And their hearts started to become hardened towards God. It was the opposite of what it could be. Why do you punish your children, Aspen? Is it A, because they're terribly behaved? B, B, no, I'm <laughs> Why do you punish your children? Because they have an action that you know growing up and going forward will not be good unless you can eradicate that behavior. Because if they're a 30-year-old, if Oni is a 30-year-old at work and she's still hitting her coworkers, taking the stapler, saying, mine, 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 My children are perfectly behaved, by the way. They'll miss that. What's the point of the punishment? Is to eradicate behavior so that they can grow and be used by God. And they missed it from petrification. Now let's talk about calcification. Calcification is inside circumstances. A process in which calcium builds up in the body tissue, causing the tissue to harden. 
I wrote down here, the lining of the arteries become inflamed, allowing plaque to form on the wall of the artery, calcification. And I'm going to go ahead and just put a footnote and put WebMD as the source for that. But the important part is this, is, is the calcification was inside circumstances. So from the inside, it becomes hardened, that area. And the Israelites experienced this as well. And here's why. Because they allowed sin to come in and harden their heart towards God. So two different ways their heart had become stone. And Ezekiel saying, I can give you a heart of flesh in its place, something that's alive, something that will benefit the whole body instead of something that is sitting there that is dead, that is useless. So how does this happen with you and I? Real easy. Are you ready? If you are saved, meaning you have submitted your life to the Lord and asked for the blood of Jesus to forgive your sins, you're good. So why does Satan want you to sin so much? Because he knows it's going to affect your relationship with God. Your sin has already been dealt with on the cross. The cross had the final word. But what do you do when you fall right back into that habitual sin, whatever it is, that you've asked God to forgive you for a, a thousand times? And you do it again. You, you, you look at those images on your phone just yet again. You run your mouth and gossip about a coworker or somebody that, that goes to this church, not you, someone down at the church on the street, yet again. You fall into those same habits yet again. What do you do? I can tell you what I do. God is disappointed with me. God is mad at me. God doesn't want to hear from me yet again. So I'm going to stop praying. I'm going to stop going to church. I'm going to stop being around other Christians because if they just knew what I was dealing with, they wouldn't want me here anyways. Can I just tell you, that's why the devil wants you to sin. To harm your relationship and make you a spiritual rocking chair. Oh, you may look good on the front porch, but you don't do anything. It's a waste of time. You become a useless tool for the kingdom of heaven. It's like when you go to Bed Bath & Beyond and they have that whole section of kitchen utensils and you're like, oh, I could buy this. I'll totally use it all the time. And it stays in that shelf or that drawer all the time and you never use it. Like you don't need an egg slicer, okay? You just don't. That's what can happen to us if we're not careful is sin can come in and cause calcification. So petrification is when God meets, doesn't meet our expectations. If he doesn't answer your prayer, if you get fired from that job, if your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or fiance decides they don't want to be, be with you anymore, then you prayed for that to work, but, but it just didn't work. And now you're mad at God because of outside circumstances. You start to harden your heart towards God. And, and there's two different types of sin. We've covered this once before. But the first one is called transgressions. It's sins of the hand. The second one is iniquity, sins of the heart. So sins of the hand are sins that you do on the outside. So if I stole your money, the actual act of me taking your money would be a transgression. The coveting of your property would be the iniquity. And the Pharisees didn't get that. That's why when Jesus said, you know, because the Pharisees, they, they were great at not having any of the transgressions, but the iniquities, their heart was far from God. And that's why when Jesus showed up, he said, even if you have lusted after a woman, you've committed adultery with her. He's trying to say you have transgressions and iniquities on the inside, and they're both sin. And so your iniquities really are what cause that calcification. So that's in chapter 36 of Ezekiel. So now we're going to pivot to the next chapter, which is 37. And chapter 37 is a very famous portion of Scripture. You may have heard of it. If you haven't, you're going to love it, especially if, like, scary movies and Halloween and um, Hot Topic, whatever, are the, <laughs> I don't know why I said Hot Topic, are your jam. You're going to love this portion of Scripture. It's known as Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. And here is what it is, though, is it is a visual representation of what he already said in 36 about how God is going to make the heart of stone become a heart of flesh and become alive again. So then he gives them a visual representation. I love Ezekiel, and here's why. He's got a flair for the dramatic, all right? Like, he, he, he doesn't, like, if you read earlier, 
I can't even, this is a sidetrack. I, I, he does all kinds of crazy things. He lays on his side for an entire year. He shaves his head. He does all these types of dramatic things to get people's attention, and I just love it. I think it's great. But this valley of dry bones is the visual representation. So he's sitting there by the water, minding his own business, and God gives him a vision. And I want you to hear it. This is showing chapter 36 of the heart of stone becoming a heart of flesh. 37, one through six, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley and it was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. There's no life in a bone, no life. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Verse four, then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord said to these bones. I will make breath enter you. Underline that word breath. We're going to come back to that. That's going to be very important in the Hebrew. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons and you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you. There's that same word. Underline that. And you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So you see this phrase, breath enter you. We, we don't see this a whole lot in Scripture, but when we do, it's very poignant. It's very important. So the word breath right here means two different things, wind and spirit. Wind and spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Where have you seen that same word used before? Way back at the beginning when God was creating man and he breathed his life into him. Then you see this again later on in the Greek at Pentecost. And Pentecost is when they met up in the upper room when the Holy Spirit indwelled the disciples because now we're in the new covenant and the Holy Spirit can now come inside of us. It's the same. It's the same word. The Hebrew iteration and the Greek iteration, but they mean the same. And it's the breath of life from God bringing something back to life again. And so what's happening here is there are layers. The first layer is Ezekiel saying, you guys are dead right now. You've given up. You no longer care, but God is still pursuing you. In fact, he cared so much that he circumnavigated your own mind and sent me the prophet to be able to speak to you, to remind you that I'm still here. And don't look at the circumstances, I'm here. And then look at this vision of this valley of dry bones. I can bring these things that are dead and cast aside back to life again. And not a fake life, not prop you up like weekend at Bernie's, if you know what I'm talking about. I mean actually breathe my spirit into you. So he's telling them about what happened to creation. He's telling them, hey, just so you know, one day I will bring you back to the land and restore it all. Keep in mind, this is like 600 BC and they didn't happen until AD 1948 when Israel became a country again. How long have you been praying for something to come back alive? If God said it, it will happen. So he's talking about what God did. He's talking about what God wants to do now. He's talking about what was gonna happen in 1948. But, but he was also the third layer, the most important layer in my opinion, is he's talking about the Messiah, that Jesus was gonna come back. And if Jesus came back and died on Good Friday and rose on Resurrection Sunday, then death has lost its sting, it has lost its power, and there's nothing in your life that can't be brought back to life again. Is your heart hurting because a marriage failed? Is your heart turned to stone because you had a friendship end? Because you had a business deal go bad? Because you were betrayed by somebody? And it's real easy to have your heart turned to stone. But Jesus came to bring th dead things back to life. Any area of your life. 
So how do we do it? This is how we'll end today. How do we do it? You go to the store and pick it up. Is there a magic algorithm that I can just A equals MC squared and figure it out? How do we do it? I don't know. See you next week. No, it'd be terrible. I don't know, but I can tell you what the Bible says about that. I look at a person in the Bible that messed up countless times, way worse than you've ever messed up, guaranteed. Yet he's referred to as a man after God's own heart, King David. Now, here's how I want to end our time. I want to read to you a very famous psalm, Psalms 51.10. And I want to read the psalm. Then I want to tell you what was going on in David's life, the circumstances when he wrote this, and then we'll read it again because this is powerful. Do not miss this. Psalms 51. It's King David. Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. I love this phrase. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Powerful words, still powerful, but even more powerful if you know what was going on in David's life as he wrote this. Now keep in mind that David This is an old covenant relationship. I love the writings of King David because it shows such an intimate relationship for the old covenant. Saying things like the Holy Spirit is in me and this intimate relationship with God like he had. Like this is prophetic, man. This is for you and I. So here's what's going on in David's life. A man after God's own heart, Grant. Here's what's happening. He just committed adultery with a married woman then set up for her husband to be murdered so he wouldn't find out that she was pregnant with his kid. Talk about the real housewives of the Philistines. How on earth is he a man after God's own heart? Because of prayers like this. How do you keep a heart of flesh when you've messed up that much? How does it not become callous? Because like, surely God doesn't want anything to do with an adulterer and a murderer, right? Yet he's going to die on the throne. But his predecessor, King Saul, he lost the anointing of God for one reason. One reason, angel, pride. How do you become a man after God's own heart? You, You start to realize it has nothing to do with your actions and it has everything to do with how much of God's forgiveness you're willing to receive and how quickly you are to confess it and receive that. So now that you know what David has done, now you know where he's at, let's read this one more time. Adultery, murder, and as he's supposed to be leading his people, this is what he does. Here's the algorithm to be a man after God's own heart. Create in me a pure heart. One translation says, created me a clean heart. I love what he had said earlier. He said, search my heart, oh God. I say that every week before I, I preach. I get him off, it's on my knees on the floor, and I say, search my heart, God. Search my heart. Search my heart. Created me a pure heart, oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. I love this right here. Because some of you have grown tired and cynical of church, of religion, of people that say the one thing and act a different way, people in your life who claim to carry the banner of Christ, but they've wronged you, and you're taking it out on God, letting your heart become hardened and calloused as stone. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. You remember back when you first got saved, how much it just brought you joy to just spend time with God and just know who you are. Restore to me that, God. Bring me back to that time. 
back before I became cynical and calloused and angry and bitter. I don't want to see things through the lens of being a victim. I don't want to see things through the lens of having offenses against me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Take this hardened, calloused, useless stone and turn it back into an artery that gives life to the whole body. That's my prayer. But whatever area of your life has become hardened, God can renew. That's why Jesus came. Church, would you stand with me? So we're going to come in to sing this song one more time, and I love it because it talks about waking up these dry bones again and just declaring how great God is because I just want to tell you that you are not a sum of your sins. Your identity has nothing to do with who you are right now or what you've done. It doesn't. It has everything to do with have you received forgiveness from Jesus? Have you received it? So I want to remind you what we've been doing the last couple of weeks is we have some of our deacons, some of the leaders of this church that will be up here on the two sides of the stage and it's open for prayer. Have someone pray with you. If you want to know what this journey is like to even give your life to the Lord, let us come pray with you and talk you through that. It needs to be more intimate and helpful than just everybody close your eyes, raise your hand. Okay, put your hand down. All right, go back to your life. It's a journey and we want to take that with you. But you got to make the first step. If there's something in your life that you've just been holding on to for a while, the band can come up. It's fine. Jeremy, come up. If there's something you've been holding on to in your life for a while, let it go. Give it to the Lord. Let an area of your life that's been dead and weighing you down and and just affecting your sleep, affecting your mental health, affecting you, give it away. That's what Jesus died for. Now, we want to pray with you for that. And if you're in a good spot, awesome. You don't have to make up problems so that somebody can come pray for you. But if you see somebody you know up here and you're invested in their life, you come pray for them. This should be a house of prayer, a house of healing, a house of forgiveness, and a house where it says if we lift up the name of Jesus, we'll draw all others to him. A house full of broken people with a common denominator of who we need Jesus. Jesus.